For out of the heart are the issues of life. If I'm going to serve the Lord, I want to serve him with all of my heart. So you apply your heart unto instruction. You learn all you can learn, work at it, even if you don't want to do it. Could I tell you something? I think it's a secret. I'm not sure. But what you don't want to do, usually, is the best thing and the most helpful thing that you'll ever do is the thing you don't want to do. You don't want to go to work, but it's the best thing you could ever do is to go to work. You don't want to go to school, but it's the best thing. If, even though you don't want to do it, you do it. You don't want to get out of bed in the morning, but when you get out of bed, you're doing the best thing you can do. Going against the grain of your own desires. You understand what I'm talking about? You, you, I mean, sometimes you may feel, I don't want to go to church, but it's the best thing that you could do. And it's character building. Many times the, the projects that come in our lives, the predicaments that may come in our lives, and we handle those face forward. We, we do it because it has to be done. Whether we want to do it or not, we're going to do it. And that's the way you grow in your character in your life. But you say, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do it. No, I'm just not going to do it. All right, you're lost. You're, you're out of the battle just about. Who wants to go into the thick of the battle? Who wants to, where the arrows are flying or the bullets are flying? But it's the best thing to do to save and salvage your family and your homeland and whatever else. It, these boys over there in Iraq, they, they don't want to be there. I'm sure they don't want to be there, but they're there because of their commitment. They're there. You understand what I'm trying to say? And in our lives as character building people, we do a lot of things we don't want to do. And if you get to the place where you don't want to do them, and you're not going to do them, you're a slop heels. You're a slop heels and you never will amount to a hill of beans because all you do is what you want to do. You're lazy and selfish and you're, you're indolent, you're worthless as far as God's work is concerned. You don't want to get out there on the doors and knock on doors and it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, it's too something else. So you say, I'll just let those people go to hell. It's when you go, when you don't want to go, your body says, no, don't go out there. And you just go right ahead. And the grit in your craw and the sand in your pants will make something out of you as a Christian. You understand what I'm talking about? That's character building. Do what you don't want to do. Study and dig and peruse in the books. Learn something. Say, oh, it's too hard. I don't know. But God wants us to move ahead with our Christian life. He, he said here in our, in our text, apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the word of knowledge. Do something about your uh, life. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I wrote down a whole scoodle of things here. And if you'd listen to your heart, let me tell you, I'm going to write down these five things I believe that change your life. I won't go through all of this because it's too lengthy, but I'll preach it someday. How to be led of God. Number one, when he counsels you, listen. That is, when he talks to you. Now you say, Brother Green, God doesn't talk. Oh, yes, he does. He does talk. He walks with us and talks with us. He does it through our thoughts. You never hear a thought, but you know something was said in your thoughts. You know when it registered, yes, I never thought of that before. Now, that's God talking to you, and when he counsels you, 
and speaks to you through your thought life and begins to impress you, then you listen to God. Number two, when he cautions you about something, beware. That is when God says, I wouldn't do that now. Don't go there. Don't wear that. Don't say that again. Don't do this. Because if you do, it would be lead into trouble. When God speaks to you and cautions you about something, then you beware of those things. And not only that, number three, when he convicts you about something, stop it. Just stop it. Don't ever do it again. If I could ever get this message to my congregation, because if you're a Christian and the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, he's going to constantly bring to your heart things that are not right. <coughs> I don't think anybody in this room smokes cigarettes. But if God spoke to you and said, now don't do that, it's a bad testimony, you're ruining your life, and you're smoking up the tabernacle at the temple of the living God on the inside, stop it. Stop that cussing. Stop that drinking. Stop that immorality. Stop that video. Stop it. Stop it. When God puts a conviction on you, then you stop doing that. And your whole life, the sister Blaine will become a matter of convictions. And if you don't follow those convictions, then you compromise with yourself and with God and the Bible. God, if you read the Bible, God will put convictions in your heart. And, and God will actually dominate your life with your convictions. You understand what I'm talking about? Well, I, I, I could, but I can't. I know I could do this, and God wouldn't kill me, and God wouldn't send me to hell for it, but it, it would be against my convictions. I've already been convicted that it's wrong. And if I go ahead and go against those convictions, <laughs> see, there's no, there's no tenacity. There is no substance about a human being that will not abide under his convictions. Who wants to change their convictions? I don't want to change them. It's sort of following through with what I just said, but I'm talking about these five things. When God counsels you, then you listen to God. And I want to tell you something about listening to God. The first impression is always God. You say, well, I couldn't do that. Uh, this would happen. That would shut your mouth. That's not true. God's not going to have come in second or third or fourth or fifth with his suggestion. He's coming in first. As a child of God, he's told you, this is, I want you to listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. Well, if I do that, well, then, then, uh, then you're all messed up. God, the first impression is God. The rest of it is human reasoning. And you better listen to God. It'll always be right. I wouldn't doubt, I wouldn't doubt not only in the spiritual world, but in the physical world. If you had some sickness come upon you, I believe God would tell you something's wrong in your body. And you would say, ah, no, I just this and that, you know. But God, God loves you, and he's not going to withhold anything from you to help you. And he'll tell you, somehow or other, it'll come to the surface. Somebody will help you to realize you've got a problem physically, and you need to take care of it. And, but he will do it spiritually. He'll help you if you listen. When he counsels you, listen. When he cautions you, beware. When he convicts you, stop. When he concerns you about something, get involved. When he concerns you about something, get involved. Like, for instance, uh, you um, get concerned about those bus kids. Get involved. Get involved. 
You may not want to be a blessed person all the rest of your life. But I being in the way the Lord led me. That's what that man said that went to get a wife for Isaac. I being in the Lord way. I was doing I was doing something for God, and God spoke to me about maybe you ought to do this. And you begin to climb the ladder with God. But you have to start. Lord, maybe I ought to take that Sunday school class in that primary department. I really wanted to become the pastor. But I, maybe if I started down here in the primaries, maybe God would let me climb this ladder or something. You understand what I'm talking about? Rather than, it's like B.R. Lake and that great evangelist said, you can go into evangelism two ways. You can either start at the top and work down, or you can start at the bottom and work up. And so it has to be such that when God is talking to you about getting involved, in some of the work of the Lord, then, uh, then I would say uh, he concerns you about things. Get involved in it. And the last thing is when he calls you, don't procrastinate. Say, I, I can't do it right now. I've got this to do, and I've got that to do, and I've got to raise my family, and I've got to pay off my bills. I've got this to do. i got that to do. I can't do it. I can't do it. But when he calls you, you better listen. And you better not procrastinate. Because God cannot move on your life and do what he wants to do. And every one of you as Christian people, and you want to be Christian leaders, that's how you get there. You don't get there. So well, I'm going to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church of New York City. You're not going to get there. You're not going to get there. I mean, that, that, that pastorate opened up here two or three years ago, and I knew a man that sent in a resume to try to get in that First Baptist Church in New York City. You know, it, it wasn't really that great of a church, but it was a church that George Washington was baptized in. He was baptized a Baptist in the First Baptist Church in New York City. And that was quite a heritage. And, but anyway, you do what you're supposed to do. Do it graciously and with all your heart. And in the process of time, God will help you. But our, our verse here, and I'm going to have to move on. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ear to the word of knowledge. You don't have to be a dumb dumb. You don't have to be a stoop nagel. You can get some smarts. The Bible said that God could make wise the simple. That simply means that a person that isn't altogether that swift, he still can gain knowledge, line upon line and precept upon precept, and here a little and there a little, and that person can get some smarts and do something for God. Am I making any sense? I better move on or I'll never get done. Uh, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Now, in this particular period of time, if you beat a man or a child with a rod, you would probably go to prison if somebody saw you do it and turned it into the social services. They would do that. They would feel like it was child abuse to do that. However, in God's, in God's economy, it was God's way of training Israelites to become godly people was to inflict some discomfort upon them for wrongdoing as a child, to train that child it's really, really, we're not in the business of child training. We're in the business of adult training, of training children to become adults. You don't have to train them to become children. They're already children. But we're in the business of training children to become worthwhile adults. And so we're going to call it correction. 
We're going to call it chastisement. We're going to call it control. We're going to call it rules. We're going to call it regulations. We're going to call it restraints. We're going to, we're going to call it punishment for doing wrong. I, I know that uh, there is so misunderstanding. Oh, misunderstanding. My dad and my mother would have been put in jail the way they raised me. But I am so glad that God let me live in another time and years when people could punish their children the way they needed to be punished. My dad would take me to the woodshed and there would be bloodshed. And it was missed, not literally, don't take me wrong, but he would whip me. I was a very stubborn, bullheaded kid. I still am a lot that way, but not like I could have been or would have been had it not been for a father that was determined to gain control over me. I had a hard time. I mean, I had a hard time with it. My discipline, my, my whole uh, understanding, I wanted my own way, and I, he was not going to let me have it. And I'm so glad. I could point out the people in this church that never got whippings, never got a spanking, never got punished for anything in their life. I could point them right out to you. They're brats. And they never got out of brathood because they're brats. Because nobody ever beat the brat out, out of them. Amen. And they're just brats. These young people of our day, 99% of them are just brats. They cuss down and swear and live like hell, go where they want to, wear what they want to, and tell you right flat to your face, go, go jump into hell. They have no, they have no respect for elders whatsoever. Doesn't mean a thing to them. So you're, you're kind of mean, but oh no, I'm not. You, you know I'm telling the truth. And as the social welfare folks, I know what I'm saying, and I realize it's not politically correct to talk about it. And I'm on video at that, and it could be brought to their attention, and they could put me in jail, but I want them to know that I'm 77 years old, and I'm looking for a retirement plan, and that would be fine with me. <laughs> I'm just trying to be smart about it, I guess, but I say you're not going to raise kids without some discipline, somehow, some form. And it's, it's like... Uh, Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And you could say betimes or behinds, one or the other. But they do need to be chastened. And it's what we call in our circles tough love. Tough love. I love my child, so I'm not going to let him be a brat. He's not going to embarrass me in public. He's not going to grow up to be a criminal, disrespect the law and everything else. I love him too much to allow him to have that liberty to do whatever he wants to do. And so it's called tough love. You understand what I'm saying? It's a, it's the right way. And he said, uh, Proverbs 29 and 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But the child left to himself bringeth mother to shame. Uh, and I'm just telling you that uh, I would rather have the child suffer a little embarrassment about getting punished than to have me suffer the shame of having a brat for a kid. Uh, well, and not only that, it goes farther than that. This is what it says in Proverbs 3, 1 and 2. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. One of the Ten Commandments was honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I'm, I'm, there's just two or three things I look at 
in the newspaper every day. I look at the headlines and the front page. I look at the sports to see who won ball games. And I look at the obituary to see if my name's in there. <laughs> but I noticed I read every obituary, just about every. I want to see how old they are. I'm 77, so I wonder if anybody died my age. But I noticed a lot of them were 80, 81, some even 90, once in a while 100. But you can reflect back upon it if you knew the, the obituary, if you knew the, I should say, the eulogy of those people, you could probably find out that they obeyed their mother and their father. Yes. And God let them live a long time on this earth. Now that's, that's the Bible. There is a, correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul, Proverbs 29 and 1. It's a lasting pleasure. Wouldn't it be nice to get old and have your children, and when they drive up in the driveway, say, oh, oh, praise the Lord, Johnny's here. Oh, John's coming. <laughs> they got that brat. Or George is coming. And I don't mind George so much, but it's that little rascal kid of theirs. Tear up this house from one end to the other in about five minutes. And John, if you listen to this, I didn't mean you, Johnny. <laughs> no, it was your boys. And that was the first name that came to my head. <laughs> But it's a lasting enjoy those children and your grandchildren. And it's pleasure to have children and grandchildren if it's just the way it ought to be. And you raise those children for the glory of God. And uh, it's because, too, you loathe evil. You don't want them to get involved. You don't want them to go to jail. You don't want them to have a divorce and not have a good marriage and a good life. You, you think ahead a little bit. You say, I, I know I, it hurts me bad to have to chastise my child, but I don't want him to end up in the divorce courts or court martial army or have a dishonorable discharge or get fired from his job because he didn't know what to do right or steal or compromise or whatever. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? I, uh, but most folks didn't get enough lickings or spankings when they were young. And uh, it's very hard to pastor a church in these days because you have a lot of brats inside your congregation. Well, chapter 23, verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, verse 16, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. How do you make a parent happy? A wise son is a pleasure to a parent. Rather than doing those things that make them unhappy. He said, he talked about the reins. By reins shall rejoice. Uh, the reins, uh, I like the heart. They're a part of the, the inside the innermost soul. Uh, we're talking about reins. When you, when you ride a horse or or use it in plowing or whatever, you have reins. And it's like steering a car. You steer a car this way, but you, the reins of a horse, you pull it this way or this way. And that horse gets that idea that he wants to turn this way or turn that way. And that's what he's saying in, here about uh, my son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice within me. Yea, the, my reins shall rejoice. And when you speak right things, 
Now, I know that I've guided you right. I know that you've got a hold of things. And I feel so much at ease to raise a good boy, to raise a good girl. Could I talk, a lot of young people in this class, let me tell you something. Pay attention to your parents. Do what they say to do. And even though you don't like to do it and resent it, it's like what I told you a few minutes ago. The things that you don't want to do are usually the best things for you to do. And when your parents don't want you to go there or they want you to do this, pay attention to them. I say it again a thousand times. They're the best friends you'll ever have. They love you more than anybody will ever love you. They will. Now you say, well, I'm married to this woman, I'm married to this man, and they love me more than, oh, no, they don't. Oh, no, they don't. That love that your husband has for you, or that wife has for you, is a human love. It is a self-satisfying self love. And many times, husbands love their wives, and they can lust after their wife, and they can relate with their wife. You don't do those things with your girl, with your baby, your daughter, your teenage girl, your grown married girl. You don't have relationships with her, no, never. You would even think of because there's a different love there. It's not a sexual, immoral, or that sort of a thrust towards that human being. It's love, pure, pure, pure love. No involvement in any tragedy to try to manipulate. No, it's pure love, pure love. That can always be said about husband and wife. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Amen. So you kids don't know at all what I said. I said it in a way so you wouldn't. But I just want you to know, they know this. And even though they may be drunks, they may be deadbeats and screwballs and nincompoop for parents. <laughs> and got a lick of sense. God will still honor you by figuring out some way that you can honor your parents. Amen. Do right by your parents and honor them in every way that you can and treat them with respect. And uh, never talk back to them. Never talk up with a loud voice, I'm not going to do that. Well, you hurt their feelings. And you hurt a lot when you hurt them. And uh, you just work hard at making your parents love you and be happy that you're there in the house. And you get up in the morning when they call you. And you go to bed at night when they tell you. And you eat what is put before you. And you compliment the cooking. And you take correction without pouting, and you clean up your mess if you make it. As Solomon was talking to his son, it's like a relationship with a son and a father. It's like a relationship with God the Father and his son. There's a double meaning here. Not only respect your father and mother, but respect God and obey him. Do what he tells you to do. And uh, I would like to have my mom and dad. I wish I could go and dig them up out of the Eureka Cemetery and have them back in my home and love them and respect them all over a fresh new. Can't do that. But you hear me talk about my mother and dad a lot. When I was growing up, I had feelings just like you did. Boy, my dad is really strict. I wish he wasn't so hard on me. But after I grew up, I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, I, I love you, and I, I wish 
I wish you'd have given me more spankings than you did. And he said, I, Dad, you spanked me with a razor strap, a piece of leather about that wide and about that long, and he sharpened his razor on. And I, I said, I'd like to have that razor strap. I'd like to hang it up in my office forever as a reminder of the chastening hand of the Lord. He looked for it. He never could find it. I found one some. It wasn't his, but I got one in my office at the house. I, uh, I appreciate it now. I didn't appreciate it then, <laughs> but I appreciate it now. And I, if I'd have had a bunch of screwball parents that were so lovey-dovey and doted on me and gave me every blessed thing I wanted, I'd never been in the ministry today, and I know that. So he's talking about people who are wise in heart. Uh, how it pleases God when we are obedient to him, when we do what he tells us to do. How wonderful it is when you do it to your parents. There's love and relationship. There is the same thing with our Heavenly Father. Uh, and the reins. You, 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 you give the control of the, the reins, the authority to your parents. And you give that same reins and authority to God. You will give it to God because you gave it to your parents. You would give it to God. If you're rebellious against your parents, you're going to be rebellious against God. You do what you want to do. It's your own life. But I'm talking to you about developing your life for Christianity and for the things of the world, for the things of the Lord. I don't know what you want, but I know what I want. I want God's blessing on my life. I'm going to have to quit there. It's, I have given myself to this lesson. I, I, I don't know how many. I got from verse 10 down to verse 16. I don't know if that's good or bad. Starting tonight with Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 17. Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Sometimes these, these verses are more than just character building. Sometimes they're instructions and uh, warnings. And tonight in this verse, he's talking about uh, not having concern about the unsaved people that are round about us, sometimes it seems that that they prosper and they're getting ahead and you're not. But uh, he's telling us here that there is an end and that there is that our expectation of our life and our future in glory will not be cut off. Uh, there's a wonderful text, if any of you are preachers and would like to preach, is that thought about there is an end. And there is an end to everything, really. Uh, if you wanted to go to the length of that, some things end in joy and other things end in sorrow. And some things in uh, in disappointments, and uh, some things in in uh, happiness in a in a well manner. Uh, some things end in marriage, and some things in in business partnerships. Some things in in uh, divorce. Some things end in broken health. Some things 
some things end in death. And some things will end in hell. There is an end, it says in our verse here. That is, uh, there is an end of life here on earth. There is uh, an end of getting by with sin. And of course, uh, there is an end of opportunities to win souls. But uh, don't ever envy people. Uh, he just said, fear God all the day long and live your life with eternity's values in view. And God will work things out for you in your life. And your expectancy the things you will look forward to, they'll not be cut off. There, I, I won't take time tonight, but <clears throat> Psalm 73, verses 1 through 24, are really strong verses about not really getting all excited about envying ungodly people in so many of our people, and mostly our young people, they watch television and they read and see magazines and how some people live in such luxury and uh, they live so poorly and they would say, oh, I guess I better set aside my Christianity so that I could have more fun in this world. But it's so disillusioned, disillusioning because the devil covers up all of his tracks so that you can't see the unhappiness and the miserable condition that is with those people who don't live for God. Uh, Solomon said, just fear God all the day long, all your life long. God will not let you come up at the end of this thing without fulfilling your expectancy. That is heaven, joy, blessings here on earth, also <clears throat> eternity with the Lord. So <clears throat> it does sort of make it's sort of confusing to <coughs> young people's minds who haven't had a chance to see both ends of the spectrum. They just see the little picture. They don't see the big picture of the whole life given to God to serve the Lord. And uh, you'd not miss out on anything. Could I say it again? You're not going to miss out on anything but a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble by sticking with the Lord. The devil, the devil is a liar. Do you know that he is? He is bad I, I, we're going to go right on tonight. I'm going to see if I can finish this chapter. Uh, it'd be a, a miracle if I did, but it'd be good to move ahead a little bit. But Proverbs 23 and 19 says, Hear thou my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. If there's three outstanding words in this little verse. First is hear, and the second is be wise, and the third is guide guide thine heart in the way. Uh, you notice it's Solomon talking to his son, hear thou my son, and to you young men that are here particularly tonight, pay attention. 
here, my son, pay attention to your parents. Pay attention to your pastor. Uh, pay attention to your principal at school. Pay attention to your professors, your teachers, and uh, pay attention to people that care for you and, and pay attention to those at work that are your superiors. You can keep yourself in, in a wonderful life if you would listen to those especially who are in authority over you. He said, be wise. Uh, be regular, be consistent. He's talking about being responsible and having character. He's talking about being respectful <coughs> to everybody and to be reasonable and not a hard-headed person. He's talking about being real and not being a counterfeit. He's guide thine heart in the way. Stay with the faith of your fathers. I'm saying it again. You're sitting in this class. This class is held in the Parker Memorial Baptist Church. This church has been established as a fundamental, independent, Bible-believing King James Baptist Church. Now, that doesn't mean that every church is like this. It isn't. We have convictions. We have standards Amen. that are set up. Uh, you don't have to follow the standards <laughs> to come to church. A lot of people that come to church, they don't follow the standards. They just live like they want to live. But if you be wise, as Solomon said, you would guide your heart into the way that's right. Now, wait a minute now. You have to guide it. You have to direct it. You have to train your mind, your heart, to go in the right way and stay away from the wrong crowd uh, and stay strong. Uh, God told Joshua, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all of the law. Turn not from it to the right nor to the left that thou mayest that thou mayest prosper with this weapon thou goest. And you, you listen to me, you think, well, I can change, I don't have to have Brother Green's standards. I don't have to live like he lives. And I don't really want his convictions. Well, I, I say this kindly. <clears throat> Until you get some convictions of your own, you can run on mine if you want to. Amen. It'll help you. You say, I haven't figured it out. Well, I've got it figured out. And I know what's right and what's wrong. I know it may seem like I have more convictions than God does. I don't know. <laughs> but I know what the Bible says. <clears throat> and it's not going to hurt you. It's going to help you to stay in the way, to stay straight, to really stay steadfast and unmovable no matter what anybody else does. <clears throat> it's, it's really, I don't know, maybe I could put it in another way, but... Uh, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Didn't he say that? He said, well, how can you be so stubborn, Brother Green, and 
push your convictions and push your standards over on me. Well, I'm following Christ. You can follow me until you get your own convictions and your own standards and get your own home set upon a rock. You can follow mine. And you can get rebellious <clears throat> against all of that and find yourself in deep trouble. I'm trying to be nice to you, but we are leaders. That's what this class is, a class for leadership. And if you're going to be a leader, then you've got to know which direction you're going, and you've got to have your head screwed on right. If you don't know where you're going, how do you expect anybody else to know? And we want to follow you. And you say, well, maybe you're wrong about some things. Maybe I am, but I'm still the leader. And that's the way it is. And I'm not intentionally going to lead anybody astray. I could lead them into a deeper Christian experience if they'd follow. And Solomon, in his wise, said, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Stay right with it. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Stay right. In verse 20 and 21, they're kind of connected. It said, be not amongst wine bibbers. These are more instructions from Solomon. <clears throat> Just st stay away from people who drink alcohol and amongst rioters of eaters of flesh people that are just gluttons. Verse 21 says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Again, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, is telling his son, stay in the way. Don't hang around folks that are jerks and screwballs and nincompoops and drunkards and gluttons and all they do is just fool away their time. He's saying, uh, well, in the Old Testament economy, death was the punishment, and the penalty for any son that was a drunkard or a glutton or would talk back to his parents. They would, they would have to take their son after trying to get him under control. And if he wouldn't come under control, he would, they were to take that boy to the priest. And the priest was to take that son outside the camp, and they were to stone that boy to death with stones. Now, that's pretty straight and strong. And of course, you do that today, you would land in jail. But I'm saying there was to be no foolishness with the Israelites. There was not to have a bunch of kids controlling the parents, but the parents controlling the children. And if they wouldn't comply, then they were out of order. Then not only were they hurting them and their family, but they may lead other people to the same sort of of uh, way of life in rebellion against their parents and gluttony and drunkenness. <clears throat> so it best to get rid of this one so it wouldn't influence the other ones bad. Young people I'm talking about. So there was a, uh, if you're a stubborn child, <clears throat> if you were a glutton, if you were a drunkard, and you were a slave to intoxication, he said, uh, there's, there's no hope for you. I write down these, these scriptures, now I'm not giving them to you tonight, but Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 20 and 21, tells about this stoning of these children who would not obey their parents. 
and uh, and who got involved with strong drink. We're talking about wine and whiskey and beer and drugs. Uh, young people, listen to this old man. Never, never let it ever come to your lips. If you never taste beer or liquor or drugs, you will never have to worry about being in the influence and control of those <clears throat> vicious things. Yeah, right. Just just leave them completely alone. I'm not being a super spiritual screwball, but I have never tasted beer in my life. Right. My dad said to me, when you see me drink my first bottle of beer, you can have one too. I never, never, ever drank. I never drank. He said, when you see me smoke my first cigarette, you can start smoking them too. And I never saw him smoke, and I never smoked cigarettes. Now, I'm not a <clears throat> holy Joe, and I'm not trying to say I'm a perfect little angel, but I'm saying if you don't get started at it, you'll never say, I'll miss out on something in this world. You're not going to miss out on anything but a heartache and a headache and <clears throat> broken hearts and broken homes and broken lives and broken health and what else? A messed up life. So what do you do? My son, don't get involved with it. Just stay away from it and never allow it to come to your lips and just follow a separated life. And there is... Um, the second thing in that verse, it talks about, despise not thy mother when she is old. I, I, uh, I have some sort of a pet uh, peeve, I guess you'd call it, with people that mistreat their parents and their mother when she gets old, and maybe a, gr a grandmother that gets old and they may get demented somewhat, or have Alzheimer's, uh, and you just mistreat these people, or they get crippled, they have a stroke, or they perhaps uh, slobber all over themselves, or uh, when they eat, they put food down on their clothes, and, and you get upset with them and mad with them, just remember this. Are you going to listen to me? You're going to get old one day, too. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that same thing that you would criticize your mother, your father, or whoever, is going to happen to you. And not only so, but God, in his wise wisdom, has made it somewhat of a law that whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. And if you sow disrespect to your parents, then your children will show disrespect to you. That's right. In the process of time, you say, well, it's not now, but in the, in the days to come. In the days to come. What I'm trying to tell you is, it's a serious thing. We have a, we have a, a, a heavenly father his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He sees everything. There's nothing goes, escapes his all-seeing eye. If you fear the Lord and live a holy life and do what he's telling you to do, you not only enjoy your family, your mother, and your dad, and your siblings, your brothers and sisters, you'll enjoy them all of your life. Quarrel and fight and bicker and yell and scream at each other and have no love for each other in the home. And you'll find out that later on it'll all come back in your lap. But you could have a wonderful, wonderful home and wonderful relationships and enjoy it not only here but in heaven together too. I'm, I'm not trying to sound like some old frump, but uh, uh, the idea of it is, uh, he's telling, despise not thy mother, especially when she is old. She's going to get feeble, and she's going to get hard of hearing, 
and she's going to have poor eyesight, and she's going to be forgetful. And sometimes they even get feisty, get a little bit ornery and cantankerous because of the irritations of their physical body. And their face may get full of wrinkles. And, uh, and somehow or other, they would be a burden to you to have them around. And so what do you do? You stick them in a nursing home because you can't handle them and uh, let somebody else take care of them. I guess there are cases when anybody <clears throat> would have to go to some facility to be taken care of. I can understand that. But you could at least go by and see them and not forsake them. And that happens all of the time. They stick them in a nursing home and goodbye, Mama, goodbye, Daddy. And that's all they ever, and I would say that uh, all of that person thinks about. I was in a nursing home last night, and Mrs. Zittle, one of our old members, is <clears throat> here in the nursing home. Well, it, it, nobody comes, but maybe one, maybe one of their daughters. I don't know, but it just hurts. It hurts her, and she cried and cried and cried. My wife tried to comfort her. You, you don't have any idea what it is to get old, but uh, <clears throat> you may be in such a position that you can't take care of. I know my mother had to be placed in a facility. It hurt me bad to have her there, and it hurt my dad. My dad didn't know what to do. And uh, they put her in a nursing home in Clare, Michigan, and but my dad wanted to, I was single, my wife had died, and I was living alone, and he said, I'd like to come and live with you, Don. Well, I, I'm in the ministry, I'm coming and going all of the time, I couldn't stay at home. I said, Dad, I, you're welcome to stay, I love you. And he stayed in another bedroom, and I kept him for maybe a week or two, and I said, no, Lord, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. Every time I go out the door, he wants to go with me. And I can't carry him everywhere I'm going. And I said, Lord, if you just show me what to do, I'll appreciate it. And just like a flash, he said, why don't you talk to the nursing home and have him move in with your mother and stay in the same room with her? And he did. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and I was relieved, too. And they were together again. So it's amazing what God can help you with all of those. But don't, don't uh, despise your mother, your father. Listen to your mother and dad, even when you get older, even if you're in your 30s and 40s and 50s, and in your 60s, if they're still alive <clears throat> and they're not demented or problems mentally, they still can have a lot of good advice to help you because they've been down life. And you don't understand what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. There is such a thing, there is such a thing as what is called life experiences. And it's better than a college university course because they've already experienced life. And they've made some dumb mistakes and they can guide you around some dumb mistakes in your life. Can you understand what I'm saying? And I'm going to go on to the next verse, verse 22. Hearken unto thy father, and, and that begot thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. That is, listen to your dad, don't despise your mother, practically the same thing as the previous verse, but uh, have you been to an old folks home lately? <clears throat> you need to go, you young people. If you've never been in a nursing home, you need to go and smell the place. It is most, they try to do better these days and keep that odor down, but parents, old people, 
they don't have control of their bowels. They lose control of their bladder. And it can be very regurgitating. And they're in wheelchairs, and somebody has to feed them. And they walk with walkers. And um, like I said, they slobber all over themselves. And you could uh, be a little disgusted that this is my mother when she was once a beautiful woman. But I'm telling you, my mother, I thought my mother, when I was a little boy, I thought my mother was the most beautiful woman in the whole world. I did. She probably wasn't. But in my conception, there was nobody as pretty as my mother. And I didn't think there's anybody any smarter than my dad. So I kind of grew up with that in my mind. Of course, you understand that you want to honor them. I still honor my mother and my father. Every day I think about them some way or another. But listen, listen to the advice is what he's saying in this take care of your mother you know you know um, Craig our Lord really set an example in just about everything that he did you remember when um, he was hanging on the cross he said he said John behold your mother and he said to his mother, Behold your son. I might have got it backwards, but don't hold it against me. But he would, I've often thought about that, Brother Gunning. I've thought about where was his half-brothers and half-sisters that they didn't want to take care of their mother. But he thought more about John, who was the beloved disciple and knew that she would be in wonderful hands if John took care of his mother. So there was a concern for his mother, even Christ our Lord. So just take this as advice from the wisest man that ever lived. And uh, let's go to verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Uh, this, this means to acquire truth by all rightful means. Uh, even at the risk of your life, I suppose. Proverbs 4 and 5 said, get wisdom, get understanding and forget it not verse 7 says wisdom is the precious thing Proverbs 16 16 how much better it is to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than to be is rather to be chosen than silver you just go for it with all of your heart to know the truth and then when you get the truth he said, don't sell it. Don't sell out to anybody. Don't give it away. You earn it, you found it, you know what it is. Don't lose it. Don't sell it. You know, uh, for these young people that are in our Christian school, actually their parents is buying the truth. They're getting an education. Their parents are paying for it. And I know that if you're a homeschooler, and somebody has to pay for it. They have to pay for the paces or pay for the material. And uh, they're buying the truth. And uh, you're not going to get the truth at the public school. Yeah. You're going to get atheism, and you're going to get uh, evolution, and uh, humanism, and socialism, and worldliness and anti-Bible and morality and drugs and drink and dirt and 
dance and demonic uh, music and all that sort of thing. So what you're doing, actually, when, whether you're homeschooling or you're sending to Christian school, you're buying the truth. You understand in the sense of the word. But don't sell it to the world. Don't backslide. Uh, don't, you know, get bamboozled into something else. I, I feel sorry. We've, we've been having a Christian school for, well, almost 30 years. There's probably about, I don't know how many thousand kids gone through here. But I would say a third of those kids are out in the world. And some of them don't even know hardly how to live at all. There's some been in jail and some had illegitimate children and two or three divorces and two or three kids out of wedlock and all kinds of stuff. And you say, oh, well, you weren't very successful, but I can tell you success stories of those who did come out of there all right. You can't just judge everything by the way it looks. One end, but I'm trying to say is they, they couldn't grasp it. They couldn't understand. And years go by, years gone by, I used to give character build a lesson every day at school. I don't do that now. I just do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But um, I'd still get letters. I'd still get letters. I got one not very long ago said, Brother Green, I really appreciate it. Those character building lessons that you gave in school, I've never forgot them. And they're still sticking with me. And I try to live by it. So, you know, sometimes things run in one ear and out the other ear. And sometimes in this class, you'll hear something say, I don't like that. But it runs through and runs out. But who knows, something might stick. And if it does stick, it might help you through the humps and bumps. And as Mrs. Blaine, there are a lot of lumps and bumps, isn't there? A lot of lumps and bumps. And if you could be steered around some of that in your life, that's what Solomon's talking about. I, I'd hate to have you be left <clears throat> bewildered and confused. Don't sell it. It's uh, the cost has been high to get the truth. Buy it, get the truth, sell it not, and don't sell out to the devil nor anybody else. Let me go to verse 24. I'm doing pretty good, aren't I, Donna? Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. The father and thy mother, thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. A lot of these proverbs have to do with parents and childhood and uh, relationships. And like I said, a lot of it is Solomon talking to his son. But, you know, you'd have to understand this truth. Would you listen these next few minutes? Where did he get all this from? Of course, he got a lot of it from God. He got, God told him he'd give them wisdom above anybody else. But truths, uh, standards, convictions, values have to be passed down. And he got this from his father, David. A lot of this from David. And the process. I wish I could, I've done this before in this class, but I'm going to do it again tonight. This, this here is, is grandpa. And this here is my dad. And this here is me. And this here is my children. And so, Grandpa passed his values to my dad. My dad passed his values to me. 
I've passed my, these values to my children. And my children are to take these values and pass them to their children. But what is happening in this day is these values have been passed down to here. But the children say, I don't want your values. They've been indoctrinated by the hippies and by humanism and socialism, John Dewey, and a lot of other fruitcakes. And they say, we, we don't want those old-fashioned values. So what has happened, are you looking? There's a gap here, and they call that the generation gap. And these parents are left here with a separation between them and their children. So what do they do? These kids are not going to accept these values. So these stupid parents, they change their values so that they can have fellowship with their children. And all of this has gone to pot. The culture, the background, the roots have been disturbed because here's grandma wearing her britches and her tennis shoes. Because that's my little diamond baby. <laughs> Because they don't have any sense. And I, I want to say, I want to say it to you, and I'm not being a smart aleck. My dad passed my, his, got his from grandpa, or grandmother, his, really his mother and grandmother, to me, and to him, and to me. And I said to these kids, you're living with me. I am not living with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. Can you understand that? Yeah. That has to be. It has to be. Or else you're going to have one big mess on your hands. Well, I gave that illustration, but it's, it's what it's, it's talking about here, that um, the basic principle is a, a, of a good parent is that they pass the values that they have received from their parents to their children. And uh, if your children are stubborn and rebellious and fools, well, that's, that's the scheme. I, I said it before, maybe I'll just say it quickly. There was things that weren't allowed at the house. But unbeknownst to me, one of my boys was doing things he ought not to do. He covered it up in such a manner I didn't know it. But one day it surfaced, and I caught wind of it. And I really had a fight with the devil. And I said, devil, you can't have my boy. Now you think you can. You think you're big and tough and strong. And you think you can have my boy. But I want to tell you right now, I didn't raise my boy for you. And you can go right back to hell where you come from and leave your hands off from my boy. And I struggled and I prayed to God. I was praying to God in one breath and telling the devil where to go in the next breath. Yeah. And I prayed and I back and forth in a puddle of slop from my eyes and my nose and my mouth. But I was totally determined that my boy was not going to be the devil's boy. Yeah. And God saw the pit that I was going through and bailed me out of that situation. And that boy got straightened out, got saved, and now he's one of the best preachers in the country. You say, all you want to say, you can do what you want to do. You want that kind of life? You want to put up with a brat at the house? You can put up with a brat. But that's not my cup of tea. And I just sure like you do as you please with it. But I think the basic here is that um, the peer pressure is so strong on these kids that they would like to go with the rest of the crowd. And uh, dad and mother. Uh, are left with a broken heart and uh, the allegiance to the parents 
and the obedience to the parents and the disloyalty and the distrust. Uh, kids, again, there's a lot said in these verses tonight. It's been strong on this, but the next generation is really important. Your children. You say, well, I don't have children yet, but you will have children. I mean, you say, well, I'm so ugly, nobody would marry me. <coughs> you ought to be around in ministry for a while. I see some of the ugliest people get married. <laughs> I, I, people I never dreamed would ever get married. They're uglier than a mud fence. <laughs> but somebody's screwball enough to marry them. So don't give up. It'll be all right. <laughs> Sooner or later, you'll get married. And uh, But anyway... Uh, Parents have this tremendous responsibility. And uh, don't be a fool and reject your parents' advice. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Don't break that chain of values coming down to you and to your family. I think that I'd like to go to verse 27. For a whore, now you see again, Solomon is, is sitting with his boy. Now he's going to talk to them about the birds and the bees. He's going to say, a whore is a deep ditch. I, I, you know, Young people today hardly know what ditches are. But when I was growing up, ditches were everywhere. The highways had a ditch on both sides of the road because, the, and the pavement or the, the road was built on a kind of a crest like this so that water would run to this ditch or to this ditch on the other side. And, uh, Many times they were deep. I can remember back when I was a boy, 16 or 17, I had a car. I had a 1929 Chevrolet. That was in 1944. So it was only a 15-year-old car, but it was a 1929 Chevrolet. And I thought I was pretty important to have a car at 16 years of age. And I, back then, you, you could drive if you were 12. Uh, and you didn't have any driver's training either. <laughs> Usually your mother and dad or somebody else taught you how to drive. That was a pretty good thing, I thought. But, you know, if kids were a little more responsible, I think they are now, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember getting off into a ditch with my car. Wow. I had a wrecker come pulling me out of that thing. But we're talking about a, a ditch. Usually when you get into a ditch or a pit, it's difficult to get out of that ditch. And he's talking about a woman that is a whore, a bad, moral woman, is a deep ditch. And a strong, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. And she also lieth in wait as a prey and increases the transgression. Aggressors of among men. Uh, he's given a little advice to young men here that they should be more interested in getting an education and getting wisdom than choosing and chasing after women. Immorality is a deep ditch. It's like a rut. If you ever get in that uh, addiction, are you listening? This ditch, this pit, it's like a rut. And you get in that rut, and it's hard to get out of it. Get in that ditch, that pit of immorality, of pornography, it's very difficult to get out of that ditch. 
when you ever get into it because your mind is messed up by it. It's like a drug. It's like tobacco. It's like drinking whiskey. It's an addiction and it gets into your thought life and it just corrupts everything about your mind. And um, you will talk dirty. You'll have a dirty mind. And uh, when you get into this ditch, it, it's more than just your mind. It gets into your heart and it becomes a way of life to you. And this addiction, this rut, this ditch, this pit, in the process of time, you become a weirdo. You become a, a sex fiend. You can become a pervert, a rapist. Your whole heart and mind, you say, you're talking to, uh, basically I'm talking to young men. I don't know women. I don't know what they think about them. I, I've never figured them out. I'm an old man, but I've never figured them out yet. Never. I, they're just sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what they are. But I know, I know that men's minds, young men as well, their mind is filthy. I don't care who you're looking at, you're looking at somebody that's filthy because their flesh will promote this sort of thing. And the TV and the VCR and the videos and the magazines and the internet will just drive you crazy with that sort of thing. And it's forbidden in the Bible. It's called fornication. And it's forbidden. You can't do it. You can't have a filthy mind and have faith in your soul and have the power of God on your life. It was said uh, in Revelation 21 and 8, whoremongers shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Bad girls are deep pits, deep ditches. A strange woman is a narrow, narrow pit. And they'll destroy your mind and your soul. And uh, verse 28, lie, they lie and wait like a lion and deceitful. You say, how do they deceive? I'll tell you one way they do it. I look at me. And they put this perfume on. It's you can't see it, but you can smell it. It's just like a deer after a doe. He can smell that doe, and that woman smells so sweet. <laughs> She's got this little perfume going for her. That's to see. It's I'm not love no, girls. Don't stop wearing deodorant. And, you know, <laughs> but I'm just saying it's a part of that. Uh, and they do more than that just perfume. They have a body language. They know just how to go about it to attract boys. What bothers me so much in these days is to see Christian women, so-called Christian women, who wear these tight clothes that show the seam of their underwear. It's wicked. It's wicked. Uh -huh. Or wear their dresses or their blouses so high that their belly button shows or their back shows when they bend over. You say, oh, well, now don't get into all that. I'm not going to go too deep. But it, that's a part of a bad now wear these slits in their skirts yeah. and allow their underwear and petticoat to be seen. 
Uh, I think if you want to have your petticoat, why don't you wear it on the outside if you want to see it? <laughs> but it's not right. It's not, I can say, well, I'm, I'm just keeping up with the fashions, Brother Green. And my skirt's so tight. If I didn't have a slit, I couldn't walk. You can fix those slits. Yep. My wife's perfect example. I buy all of her clothes. You say my wife looks pretty and like what she I wear. I buy everything she wears. She's got a whole bedroom full of clothes. But I'm just trying to say we don't wear slits. She could put a kick pleat in that thing and it looks just as nice. And you got just as much room. I'm just trying to tell you though, that body language and that clothing a lot of suggestive words and little eyelids. They just, mm -hmm. uh, they just you know, many a man and a little cute little smile. And, mm -hmm. First thing you know, you're a dead meat boy. You're a meat. You're a dead meat. Increases the transgressions among men. Oh my my my! There is a character building lesson here about staying clean. It is. It is Paul said, Brother Armstrong, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Isn't that what he said? Amen. Just leave them alone. Don't even hold their hand until you're married. I mean, it's your life. Do as you please. And I want to tell you what, you're going to do just as you please in my little sermonette to Christianettes who smoke cigarettes and drive Corvettes is not going to change your mind a bit more. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to this 29th verse and 29 and 30 and 31, 32, 34, 45. We'll go all the rest of the chapter. We'll do all of it. Who has wool? Who has sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, kind of a, kind of much to be said about liquor, in the Proverbs, Solomon seemed to add some insight on the, the awfulness of it. Who hath woe? You know, woe, woe is a, a judgment that, that's basically in the Bible. And it's something to do with troubles. I, we had a president when I was a kid. His name was Roosevelt. And, uh, he was from Virginia, and he would say, his wife's name was Eleanor. She was a terrible, liberal, wow, wicked woman. I think Hillary Clinton is patterning her life after her. But he, that's just a joke. It's not, it's not really what he said. But he said, I hate war, and Eleanor hates war. But if I had to choose between Woe and Eleanor, I'd take Woe. <laughs> uh, who had <asked> Woe? <laughs> well, that was foolishness. <laughs> but there, I, I listed six curses of drunkenness. Verse 29. There's woes. That's just trouble and judgment. There is babbling, which means senseless talking. There is sorrows, which of course is heartache. <coughs> there is contentions, which means fighting and quarreling and bickering. There's wounds. Who have wounds? You know, your body cut up and fighting and quarreling, minds messed up and your heart's messed up. 
and verse six, I mean the sixth one is redness of eyes. It does something to your chemistry of your body. Alcohol has a hard effect on your heart. It has a bad effect on your liver and has a bad on uh, your mind and your eyes and your heart. And really, there's a lot of problems, not only with drinking it, but because of it. 51% of all the people that die of accidents in automobiles, 51% of it, there's alcohol involved in it one way or the other, either the driver or the other person that hits you. So it's, there's no good coming out of it at all. Sorrows. He talks about sorrows. That's financial problems because you're going to buy liquor if you haven't got money to buy food. You're going to buy liquor. And not only that, but there will be domestic problems of quarreling and bickering in, with the wife and the husband. And then there will be a loss of jobs or a loss of time of making money, a loss of, uh, really a, a loss of uh, uh, wife or health. And there's nothing much good going to come out of any kind of drink whatsoever. Strong drink. There used to be a song. They don't sing these songs. Cigarettes and whiskey and wild, wild women. They'll drive a man crazy. They'll drive him insane. That's a good old hillbilly song. I've heard that one. And it'll just drive you crazy. It'll absolutely ruin and wreck, destroy your marriage, your life, your hope, your children, your happiness. I, but I, I, I'm not being screwball, but there are probably some of you that'll end up in a drunkard's grave that are sitting here before me tonight because you haven't got enough sense to stay away from that kind of stuff. Really, millions, millions of people have been destroyed because of that liquor. And uh, it's your life, and again I say, do as you please to do, and you're going to do it anyway. But wine, wine is, uh, there's different connotations of wine in the Bible. Uh, wine is something basically that's made out of fruit. And most We think of wine as grape juice, grape, fermented grape juice into wine. But they use mulberries and they use dates and figs and dandelions and all kinds of stuff to make wine out of. But, uh, and in the Bible, it mentions wine 142 times in the Bible. Uh, many times it speaks about fermented wine. Um, sometimes it uh, talks about mixed wine. Sometimes they put spices of different sorts and spike the wine into making it taste different. But. Uh, the Bible said wine is forbidden when it turns red and when it is bubbles. You have a wine in the Bible, it's called wine, just grape juice itself is called wine in the Bible. In that English translation, that's the way it was put. And you'd have to have a little discernment to understand when it's speaking about strong drink, and it, it does talk about strong drink. But we're talking tonight about getting involved in alcoholic beverages. But wine that we drink at the communion service is great juice. I don't know how in the world, Brother Dennis, anybody could conceive 
that the Lord would set up the Lord's Supper with intoxicating liquor. Mm -hmm. Almost seems blasphemous. Yeah. Yeah. So he's talking about wine. He's talking about grape juice. Uh, I'm going to give. I'm going to read uh, verses 30 down to 35, and then I'm going to make a comment on it, and I'm going to close. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that, ha that lieth upon the top of a mast, a ship, of course. They that they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. Let me give you seven characteristics of a drunkard in these verses. First one is he's in intemperate. That means his liquor is out of control. He is a drunkard. He's intemperate. When, you, when you're temperate, you don't drink wine. Intemperate means you do drink wine and liquor. Number two, it talks about delirious delirium tremors. Have you ever heard of delirium tremors? Some people, when they get drinking whiskey and strong drink, they'll get seeing snakes. They call it snakes. They'll see snakes all over the wall, all over everything. Their mind becomes so affected by it that they have what they call tremors. And uh, they said that there in verse 30, you know, sting like an adder, snake like a snake. And then there's immorality involved, verse 33. Be looking at strange women. There's something about drinking and immorality that go together. Woe to him that puts the bottle to his brother's lips that he may look upon the, if his nakedness. There's a connection with that, drinking and immorality. And you kind of lose your morals. You kind of lose your sense. Kind of lose your straightness when you get drinking, and comes into babbling there in verse uh, 33, just uh, indecent talk and and uh, just allow a lot of things. You say a lot of things you don't even mean, senseless stuff. And then in, the, in verse 34, there's talks about that reeling and falling and wobbling and unstable, you lose, you lose the, uh, your uh, equilibrium and you become dizzy and you become stagger, stagger like a drunken man is what he, he's talking about. I think about, when I think about a, a wobbling and stumbling drunk, I think about what D.L. Moody once said, he was, on the streets of Chicago, and there was a drunk staggering down the street. And uh, he said to the man, he said, that man right there is D.L. Moody, but by the grace of God. And uh, you can say the same, by the grace of God. And then there is the insensibility. He, he don't know where he's been or what he's doing in verse 35. And... Um, and in verse 35, I'll seek it again. He's under bondage. He is, he's a slave. My son, 
Give me thine heart, he said there in verse 26. Listen to me. Stay away from bad people and bad women and bad drink. That's those three things in this little last part of this chapter. It is so, it is so deceitful. I, uh, let me, let me, let me just give a little illustration, okay? I know I've taken more time than I normally do, but, uh, I, I had, a, my, my three youngest children went to Bible college at Massillon Baptist College in Massillon, Ohio. They graduated. Dr. Bruce Cummings was the pastor of that church and, of course, president of the school. But he told a story about his family. He had a brother who grew up in the same home, had convictions and standards and values just like him. And uh, he was a Christian boy. But he got married and they, they, they had one little thing they liked to do better than anything else. They liked to eat out. Well, in order to eat out and enjoy it, you almost have to go to some place that has liquor because mm -hmm. it has the atmosphere. They have the little lights and, you know, it's, you could go to McDonald's but, or Burger King, but they liked to go and they, they would always serve cocktails, you know, and uh, they'd say, would you like to have a cocktail before the meal while you're waiting for your meal? Oh, no, we don't drink. We're Christian people. We don't drink. And he said that went on and on and on for years. But one day he was tired and he's, and the waitress said, could I give you a cocktail? And he said, well, maybe I'd try it. So he had a cocktail. Mm -hmm. And that led to drunkenness. And it led to a breakup in the marriage. And Brother Cummings told about the day that him, his brother and his wife busted up and he left the home and left the children, and he said that little boy of his grabbed a hold of his leg and said, oh, daddy, 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 don't leave us, daddy, don't leave us, don't leave us, daddy. But he left it anyway over that damnable liquor. It would take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cause you to pay more than you want to pay. That's it. I hope it's been worthwhile. We're going to start with a chapter 24 tonight. Verse 1 and 2. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. For their heart study of destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. Pretty well, the previous chapters, we pretty well covered and made comment and uh, similar verses. But let me say this, that God as Christians and as Christian leaders, as you dear people would like to be, we cannot take up companionship with evil people. Don't envy them and want to be like them. Evil men, talking about evil people, people that are crooked, they're liars and cheats, deadbeats, schemers, full of mischief. They study destruction, how they can hurt. 
it's our our standards cannot be defiled by hanging around or companioning with these kind of people. Now, you tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. You're not going to rise much higher than your friends. And if you hang around this people, you are going to discredit yourself. People will not have respect for you if you clutter up your life with hanging around people that are not good people. There are plenty of good people. In our Christian circles, in our church, our church has wonderful people in it. There are some people in our church, right here in the midst of our class, that tonight uh, somebody yelled, fire, fire, and some little child put a toy in the microwave up in the nursery, so we got pretty excited about that, but uh, it's all over and everything is just fine. I was talking about Proverbs 24. Verses 1 and 2, which is talking about making the right kind of companions and associating ourselves with people that will not bring reproach upon the cause of Christ. I want to say something about this. I, 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 I've said it a lot of times, but I say it again. I, I don't really care much for super spiritual people. People who are so goody-goody and uh, that they will not even humble themselves to talk to people that are bad and wicked and ungodly. And uh, that's not our position at all. Our position is to be kind and good and thoughtful and loving to everybody, yeah. but not to be buddy-buddy with those that are not living right and doing right. Now, let me also say that a part of our Christian responsibilities as leaders, as uh, 1st, 2nd Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It, it, there's there is no place for anybody in leadership in the Christian life that is not separated from the world and from worldly pleasures and from worldly people. Second Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath uh, light with darkness? Well, there's no place for us sitting around fellowshipping with people who are not good and godly. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your testimony. And like I said, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. There's something about Christ sincerely trusting in Christ, sincerely wanting to serve the Lord. You have to understand that Christ divides. He separates. He divides. Sometimes it divides mothers from dads, husbands from wives, and children from parents, parents from children, and from loved ones, and friends and neighbors. There's a, there's a dividing there. You just cannot, you can be nice and kind and thoughtful. Do all you can do and should do. 
but don't get involved with these kind of people or else it will hurt you. I, 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 ever since I was a young pastor, there's been a verse of scripture. I, I might have preached on it one time in all these years, maybe twice, but I can't, I can't remember. But it's a wonderful verse if any of you young preachers or any old, anybody would like to preach on it. I think it's great. It's Exodus 11 and 7. No how that the Lord that put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God's put a difference between God's people and the worldly people. Maybe some of you haven't learned that yet, but I, I think from what I can observe, most of you have done that. You have made a break from the world. Separation in itself is a doctrine throughout the Bible. It, uh, it really declares who is really on the Lord's side. When you're a separated Christian, it means that you're made up your mind that you're going to serve God and not mammon, not the world, and not be involved in worldly things. I'm trying to help you. I don't know if I'm saying it just right or not. But to be separated it demands dedication and real determination not to be involved in or practice worldly things. And most of you know, if have any connection with me, know I'm so dead set against television because it is so corrupt Amen. and so worldly. Mm -hmm. And I'm shunned. I wouldn't want to put the whole invention down and say that it isn't a wonderful invention because it really is tremendous to think about the capacity of picking up these pictures out of air and putting them into a screen on a television screen. It's almost incredible. I can remember when I was just a little boy, maybe 13, about 13, I went to a place, I was living in Detroit, and I went to a place where WJR, which is a radio station, had set up a, a television. This is, this is 1941. This is before our televisions were on the market. And my mother and dad was in one tent and I was in another tent, and they took pictures of me in this tent, and they could see me on the screen in another tent. We thought that was one of the most wonderful things in all the world. 1930, well, 1941. But um, it is a wonderful invention. But it looks like to me that the devil has really taken over the industry. Now. There are some good things on television. I'm, you you can know that just about every garbage can has got something good in it. And if you want to dig down through all the garbage, you might find something you could eat. <laughs> you understand that? And that's about the way it is with television. There are some good things there, but it would You'd have to have a strong power, willpower, to be able to discern what you should be watching and what you shouldn't watch. But it takes determination and dedication to be separated. And it takes um, a, a kind of a development that comes with Christian growth. Separation develops 
it gets stronger and stronger and stronger as you become a stronger Christian. Unless you backslide. You know, when you backslide, that you're going the other direction. And people who are have been strong Christians can backslide. And one of the best ways is that if you've taken a television out of your house and you put one back in, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Percy Ray, probably one of the greatest Christians I've known in my life, said that if a Christian ever takes a television <clears throat> out and puts it back in. Usually some great tragedy happens to that family one way or another. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't mess with it. I'd leave it in before I'd take it out and put it back in. It has to, it has to, television isn't the only thing you're separated from. You're, you're separated from the world, but you have to be separated unto Christ. There's mm -hmm. a devil. Then there's all sorts of stuff separation and and really to be honest with you there is no end to it there is no end to it I mean the Amish people and bless their heart believe that you shouldn't have an automobile because it's worldly and whatever and they have horses and carriages and you say well that's carrying a little bit too far well to them that's not I mean you know we could we could We can shut off the lights in this building because it's modern. But I'm just, I'm not trying to be funny, but there is no end to it. And some people carry it to the place where it's almost ridiculous and make a fool of themselves in this world. But when you're separated, you display your love for God. And really, God delights in you when you're separated. So you really believe that? Well, I read the Bible, and the Psalm chapter 4, verse 3 says, The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. He, he, set, he set you apart. You separated unto him, he'll set you apart. And he'll love you. Well, he loves everybody. God loves everybody in the sense of his whole nature is love. And I'm sure that he doesn't love me anymore and he loves you. I'm not trying to say that. But it does, God does show some respect for people who walk uprightly and try to do right. Now, I'm sorry. I've been a little long on that verse or two. But we did have a fire drill in between that, did we not? Let's go into chapter 24, verse 3. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Houses, homes, had to be built. I'm sure that all of us are cognizant. If you're set out to literally build a house, maybe as a carpenter or as a mason, and pour the foundation and put in all of the structure of that house and finish that house it take a, a person by themselves if they did it would take them probably a year to do it all by himself you might do it quicker but have help it, it doesn't take quite so long but it's a lot of w-o-r-k work it's not something easy. And uh, to build a home, we're not talking about building a house right at this moment, but building a home 
It takes a lot of work for families to construct and to undergird and to develop their home. But he said uh, it takes wisdom. By wisdom a house is built and established and enriched unto the place where he said the chambers, the rooms of the house are filled with precious and pleasant riches. It's, it's my it's my thoughts that the home is the bulwark of society. It's the foundation of society. Home and marriage instituted by God. It's interesting to study the Bible. You know the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the first couple, three chapters, talks about a marriage of Adam and Eve. And the last book of the Bible and the last chapter of the Bible talks about a marriage and a bride and a bridegroom. The, the, the Bible begins with a marriage and ends with a marriage. And there are a lot of marriages in between the pages of the Bible. And marriage is really quite an important part of the Bible. It doesn't seem to be that important to some people now, but uh, I, I believe the breakdown of our civilization is the breakdown of the home. The uh, home itself, the structure of it, the people that live in it are, are, are involved in a, in a struggle to, to, at least mom and dad, to bring that home into unity and a bond of peace. I think that unless you have a a good home, a good home life, it's very hard to be straightened out emotionally. That is, uh, people have mental breakdowns, have distraught uh, thoughts, uh, nervous tensions are brought about by it. A home life that isn't peaceable and precious and pleasant as our verses talk about here. I don't think ever in the history of our country have we had so many weirdos and kooks and psychopathics and spaced out space cadets, ding-dong, screwballs, ding-bats, space cadets that we have. And people are screwballs. Maybe it's just you and I are the only ones that aren't. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. But I'm trying to say is we're in a, a terribly 